So we will continue on these, uh, looking at the lives of these two uh, kings in the Bible, David and Saul. And we saw in the last session how one of them represents the will of a man. That was Saul. Saul was the people of Israel coming to God saying, we want a king, the will of the flesh. And it was not necessarily that having a king was a bad thing, but it was just not God's will there and then. David, he represents the will of God. Because David, he gets the testimony that he was a man after God's own heart. And in this session, we will come a little bit more into what that means. But I just want you to, to remind you of that, that Saul represents the will of man. And David represents the will of God. And in our lives, there, are, there can be souls and there can be Davids. There can be things in our lives that are our will. And there can be things in our lives that is God's will. And what we need to learn is we need to be, to be a David, true and true. We need to, to be patient enough that when there are things in our lives that we maybe know God has called us to do, we need to be patient enough to allow God to arrange the circumstances so those things come to pass. I mentioned that there are three, three areas where their lives were different, and that is what we are going to be looking at in this session. It was their fear of the Lord, their patience, and their secret life with God. And I believe, indeed, there are probably many other areas in their lives that you could study, and I would absolutely encourage you to do that. To, to look at uh, to the similarities and the differences when it comes to David and Saul's life. But I, leave, I believe these three, the, the fear of the Lord, patience, and a secret life with God, that was the key to David's success. But the lack in these areas was also the key to Saul's failure. So we will take a look at them. First point is that uh, the fear of the Lord. Um, many Christians have a problem with the fear of the Lord, maybe because it, it, it can sound like an oxymoron that we, we should love God, but we should also fear God. And it, it might seem strange that we are called to love someone, that we are also called to fear. And, because, and the problem is that many people today, they have a wrong understanding of love and they also have a wrong understanding of fear. So because they have, how to say, misunderstood both love and fear, they don't see how the fear of the Lord and the love of the Lord actually is knit together. You know, fear is not always a bad thing. Fear can be a wonderful thing. Actually, fear keeps you alive. Because you fear getting run over by a car, you look, you know, to both sides before you cross. If you had no fear of the cars in the traffic, you would very quickly get driven down. Because you have fear maybe of uh, weapons or knives, that's a good thing that you have a healthy fear of, maybe, of weapons. It's a good thing that you have a healthy fear of the law of gravity. If I'm up on a building, it's good that I have a healthy fear of falling down. If not, I might be careless and I would very quickly slip, fall down and die. Fear can keep you alive. Fear is not always a negative thing. Fear becomes negative when fear controls you and when fear becomes unreasonable then fear becomes a problem. But fear in itself is not a bad thing. In the same way, you know, love. Many people have the idea of love, that love is something, you know, then uh, it's some kind of fluffy, f mushy feeling. Uh, and if you have love, then you are never angry. And if you are a loving person, then you are always, you know, kind and gentle. And... But, you know, love can be very, it can speak hard. Love can be tough. Sometimes love will take you 
and maybe shake you as a parent who is uh, raising a child. Sometimes, you know, you need to discipline the child. You need to, 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 to tell what is right and what is wrong. Not because you hate the child, but because you love the child. And because you want the best for the child. Love. To, to just let the child do whatever it wants and to never uh, correct or discipline the child. That is not love. That is misunderstood love. Love teaches a child to walk in the right way. Now that doesn't mean that you should hit your child or to be mean to your child. That is absolutely not love. But love can be stern sometimes. And we need to understand the fact that God is love does not mean that he will just, you know, ignore the sin of mankind. No, no. God is love, yes. But God is also holy. God is good, yes. But he is also just. And God's goodness will never compromise his, ju his justice. God's love will never make him... Um, how to say, his love will never make him look between the fingers when it comes to people's sin. He might love them, yes, but he will not fail in executing a righteous judgment because he is both love and righteous. He is both good and holy and true. God is all of these things. And one side doesn't push away another side. I know today many people, they are saying, well, uh, you know, God is only love. Yeah, God is love, but that's, he's not only love. There are other sides of God. That doesn't mean that the love of God is diminished. It just means that there is more to God than just being love. He is also, at, at the same time as he has a loving father, he is also a righteous judge. And if we want a whole, you know, a complete picture of God, we need to incorporate all of these different sides of God into our view of God. So, fear is not always bad, and love does not mean that God looks between the fingers when it comes to our sin. Um, so, what is the fear of the Lord then? If the fear of the Lord uh, doesn't mean that we are afraid of God. W what does it mean to fear God? Basically, you could say there is a fear that makes you run away from God. And there is a fear that makes you run away from the things that can, how to say, destroy your fellowship with God. That is the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not being afraid of God in the sense that you run away from him. Adam and Eve, when they had sinned in the Garden of Eden, they hid themselves. Why? Because they were afraid of God. They knew they had sinned, and they heard God was coming, and they hid because they were afraid. Joseph, when Potiphar's wife wanted to sleep with him, it says that he ran out of the house, and he left his coat, and he probably regretted terribly, terribly that he left his coat, but he ran away. He didn't try to, to be reasonable. No, he just ran. Why? He says later, he says, how can I do this sin against God? They, Joseph, he ran. Why? Because he had a fear of God in his life. There is a fear that will make you hide from God. That is not the fear of God we are talking about. And, but there is a fear that will make you stay away from anything that, that can destroy your relationship with God. That is the true fear of God. And you know, the Bible says that in, in uh, Proverbs 8.13, it says, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Hate evil. Why? Because they know that that will destroy the relationship with God or with the Lord. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. If you have the fear of the Lord in your life, 
you will avoid evil. Why? Because you know that will separate, that will put a separation between you and God. And you cherish God so much, you cherish your relationship with Him so much that you will run from anything that can destroy that relationship. It's kind of like with a, a husband and a wife. It's good for a husband and a wife to, to have a... I'm not afraid of my wife, but I'm afraid of anything that can destroy my relationship with my wife. So I take certain precautions and I, and I make sure to, to, to maintain that relationship. Why? Not because, not because I'm afraid of her, but I don't want to lose that. I cherish her and I cherish our relationship and I don't want anything to come in and destroy that. So in that sense, you could say I, I have, a, maybe you could say that I have the fear of my wife. <laughs> but you know, when we have the fear of the Lord in our lives, it doesn't mean that we are running away from God, but it means that we are running away from everything that can destroy our relationship with God. When you look at Saul and David, this becomes very clear in the sense that when Saul got under pressure, as you also will do in life, when Saul got under pressure, he ended up listening more to other people than to God. Why? Because he was more afraid of other people than he was of God. So when the enemy was getting close and Samuel the prophet had says, wait until I come with sacrificing before they went to war, he saw the enemy was getting closer, he saw the people was getting restless, he saw that the prophet was getting late. What does he do? Under pressure, he takes matter into his own hands, even though he knew that God would not be in favor of that. Why? He was more afraid of the people than he was of God. David, what did he do when he got under pressure? There is one story where the people that are following David, they get so tired and you know the uh, the enemy that had taken their wives and their children and they end up turning their back on David actually wanting to kill David what do David do there is this little phrase that I love it says but David strengthened himself in the Lord that's what David did when he got under pressure whether you have the fear of the Lord in your life or not will determine how you handle pressure. Because if you have the fear of the Lord, when you get under pressure, you will go towards God. But if you don't have the fear of the Lord and you get under pressure, you will end up pleasing other people. You will obey the one you fear. I want to repeat that. You will obey the one that you fear. If you fear people, you will do what people think you should do. If you fear God, you might know that some choices will not be approved by other people. But if you fear God, you will end up obeying Him instead of the people. And in life and in ministry, it's so important that we understand this. Because we will come under pressure. And unless we have this fear of the Lord, we will end up fearing people. And what does, uh, what does the Bible say about fearing people? Proverbs 29, 20, 25, Proverbs 29, 25 says, The fear of man brings a snare. Whoever trusts in the Lord shall be saved. The fear of man is a snare. Not having the fear of the Lord in your life will bring you into a snare. But he who trusts in the Lord shall be safe. You know, there is a story, a true story, that I heard about an American minister who fell into to big sin. He, he totally, how to say, ruined his uh, ministry. 
Uh, he was caught having an affair with a prostitute. He uh, had uh, mishandled money. And he got caught and he even ended up in jail. And there was a magazine that wanted to do an article about him. So somebody was interviewing him, uh, you know, about his life, his ministry, about his, how he had fell and, you know, all of these things. And there was one interesting question that, uh, the, that was asked. Uh, the journalist, he asked, when did you stop loving God? Because the journalist, he kind of assumed that, you know, if he did all of these bad things, he couldn't really love God. So he asked, when did you stop to love God? And then he replied, no, I never stopped to love God. I always loved God. Even though I knew what I did was wrong, even though I knew that I was living in sin, I really, from the depth of my heart, I really did love God. The problem was, I didn't fear him. And because I didn't fear, fear him, I ended up under pressure, I ended up doing bad choices. You know, the fear of the Lord is a protection that will guard you against making the wrong choices when you get under pressure. And you will, in your life, there will be times where you get under pressure unless you cultivate the fear of the Lord in your life, you will end up making bad choices. We see about David, because he had the fear of the Lord in his life, there is this story in 1 Samuel 26, 8 to 11, where David and his man, they are hiding in the cave. And while they are hiding there, Saul and his men come. And they come into this cave and they go to bed. They, they sleep in this cave, not knowing that David and his men are in this very cave. So Saul, he goes to sleep. And suddenly, David has the perfect opportunity to kill Saul. And he knows he can get away with it. And his servant, servant uh, if you read 1 Samuel 26, 8 to 11, uh, he, he is ready. He says, please, just let me strike. I will not have to strike twice. I can pin him to the ground. And Saul, David, he says, no, no, no. Da no, David said, do not kill him. For who can remain innocent after attacking the Lord's anointed one? Surely the Lord will strike Saul down someday, or he will die of old age or in battle. The Lord forbid that I should kill the one he has anointed. And then David, he takes a jug and a little bit of his coat to later show Saul that he was able to kill him, but he didn't do it. But, but I find this amazing. Here David is with the perfect opportunity to promote himself to king and he can get away with it. Yet he says no. Why? Because he fears man? No, because he feared God. He knew that God would not approve of this way of becoming king. He says that for surely the Lord will strike Saul someday. So he knew that Saul had it coming. But Saul said, it will not be from my hand. The Lord will take care of that. That's the attitude when you have the fear of the Lord in your life. Why was Saul rejected and David approved? It was because Saul, he feared people more than God. But David, he feared God more than people. What is the difference? With Saul under pressure, he ended up pleasing men. That always brings you into a snare. David, when he came under pressure, he took refuge in God. And God took care of his problems. We need to be a David. We need to cultivate the fear of the Lord in our life so that when we get under pressure, we don't end up just doing what people want us to do, but we take time to be in the presence of God. Even though we are under pressure, we seek the Lord and we hear from Him. So important. 
I will go a little quicker through the two other last points. Their patience. I, th I think this is one of the, th one of the uh, areas where I maybe have a little bit of compassion with, with uh, Saul. Because Saul, he became king overnight. From one day to another almost. He one day he was an ordinary man. Almost the next day he was suddenly the king of a whole nation. That is a serious jump in position. And you know many people, they will say, wow, that's wonderful. Going from being an ordinary man to suddenly being the king, that sounds wonderful. No, that sounds terrible. Because Saul had no time to prepare his character, his skills, his, to prepare himself for being a king. Yes, he had the call of God upon his life. Yes, he had the anointing upon his life. But he had no time to develop his character. And you know, anointing can be good, but with anointing without character can kill you. Many ministers have failed, but I can tell you one thing for sure. There is not one single minister who have failed because of lack of anointing. Not one single minister have failed because he didn't have enough anointing. But there was tons and tons of ministers who have failed because of lack of character. What determines if you will stand or if you will fall when the storm comes is not your anointing. And that, this is very important to get. What, what will determine if you will stand or, you, or whether you will fall when the storm comes is not your anointing, it's your character. Yes, it's good with anointing. We want anointing. We want the gifts of the Spirit and all of these things, yes. But what will make you stand in the storms is not the gifts of the Spirit. It is the fruit of the Spirit, the character. That's what will make you stand in the storm. And unless we understand that, we will put all our emphasis on working on the gifts of the Spirit. And then the devil is he's just waiting for us to get puffed up. And when we are puffed up enough, he just goes like, and we fall. Why? Because there is no character. And David, for Saul, he didn't have... He, he went from an ordinary man to a king in one day and in some kind of way it destroyed his life. But the amazing thing about David is that David, even though he knew that Saul had been rejected and even though he knew that I have been anointed as king, he went out and he watched the shepherd, the sheep for his father. Not only that, sometime later, he ended up being a servant of Saul. You could say in many ways, David, he served beneath his calling for 12 years. Even though he knew I am actually the one God has anointed king, even though Saul wanted to kill him, David still wanted to serve Saul. He served beneath his calling. And it was that very thing that built character enough into him to handle the position of being a king when that day came. We have many people today, as soon as they realize that they have a call upon their life, they don't want to help with the chairs. They don't want to help with uh, washing or cleaning. Or they don't want to... No, no, no. That's beneath my calling. Well, David, he served beneath his calling for 12 years. And he was okay with it. He says, I know God has anointed me to be king. And in the time, God will put me there. And I trust God. I will not take matters into my own hands. But I will trust that in the right time... God will put me where I am supposed to be. I find that amazing. Patience. When you look at the different people that God used in the Bible, we see that God, very often, He has a lot more time than we have. Joseph, as a young man, 
He, ha- he dreamt, he knew that God had called him for greatness. Yet he had to wait 13 years before the call of God became a reality in his life. But in those 13 years, when he was sold as a slave, his attitude was, okay, if I'm a slave, I'll be the best slave there is. And the whole house of Potiphar got blessed because Joseph was a slave. When he ended up in prison, well, okay, then I'll be the best prisoner there is. And he ended up, not in a short time, he was basically running the whole prison, even though he was an inmate in that prison. He was doing his best wherever he was, trusting that when the time is right, God will put me where I should be. Thirteen years. Abram got the promise of God of a child. He waited for 25 years before he saw the realization. Moses waited for 40 years. Jacob, 20 years. David, 12 years. Jesus, this is kind of interesting. Jesus, he waited 30 years. And then he had three years in ministry. Today, we have three years of preparation at the Bible school, and then 30 years in ministry. Jesus, he had 30 years of preparation and three years in ministry. We flip it completely around. We think three years is enough to prepare you for 30 years in ministry. No, we need to allow God to put us where we should be at his timing. I rather like Jesus' model, being willing to just be an ordinary man for 30 years, even though you know you're the Son of God. And you know, when he has this attitude, he didn't need to serve for more than three years, and he had done what he should do. Noah, I don't think you will, God will call you to wait as long as he waited, because he waited for 120 years before the things that God had spoken about came to pass. So God, he has a, he, God, he is not in a hurry. We are often in a hurry, but you know, when he makes us wait, it is for our own good. The reason he holds back is not because he doesn't want us to step in to the things he has called us to, but it is because he wants us to be ready for the things that he has called us to. And we should be just as interested in preparing for doing what God has called us to do. We should be just as as eager to prepare than to actually do the things that God wants us to do. Many, they want to right away start to do what God had called them to do, but they they have no interest in preparing for what God has called them to do. We need to be like David, being willing to serve beneath your calling for 12 years. And when the time was right, it was no problem for God to put him right on the throne. Joseph, 13 years, he served beneath his calling. He knew he was called for greatness, yet he was a slave, he was a prisoner, but because of his faithful serving beneath his calling, God could put him from the prison cell to the throne in one day. And he was ready for it. Why? Because he had had 13 years of serving beneath his calling. I think that is so important that if you want to be in ministry, if you want to be used by God, make sure that you are also willing to serve beneath your calling. Don't be so big that you can no longer help with practical things. Don't become so high and anointed by God that you almost have to float in on the page on the stage and people have to clap when you come and people have to speak you know all nice things about you no be willing to serve beneath your calling and God will put you where he wants you in his time and then you can know that you are ready for it and that you will not fall when the storm come last point And I think in many ways, this point is where the two other points come from. This point is kind of like the foundation for the two other points. And it is 
their secret life with God. When you read about David, you see that he had a very passionate and intimate secret life with God. And you can see that very clearly when you read the Psalms. You can see David's intimate, personal relationship with God. God, the presence of God, was his heart's desire. He said, like, one day in your presence is better than a thousand others. He, he longed to be there with God in the secret place. David had major blunders. He, he failed big time. But when the prophet came and rejected him, his cry was not, Oh God, please don't take your position as king away from me. No, his cry was, God, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, having the presence of God, meant more to him than being king. But Saul, when Samuel came and rebuked Saul, Saul, he, he repented. He says, yes, you, you are speaking right. I am guilty. But now go with me so I don't lose honor in the sight of the people. Saul was interested in his position. Yes, he knew he had failed. He admitted to Samuel that he had failed. But then he said, Samuel, now you must go with me so that the people don't think less of me. David, his cry, I don't care what people think, but God, please don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. And then he lied on his face for three days, repenting. We see one of the big differences in Saul's and in David's life was their personal relationship with God. It's very easy to come to a meeting and lift your hands and cry hallelujah and dance and sing and shout. But the question is, what do you do when you are home alone? How is your life with God when nobody else looks at you? What is your life with God like when you are tired and when nobody else is watching what you're doing? That's where you find out who you truly are. What determines your life in public is what's happening in the secret place. You know, with the iceberg, they usually say that an iceberg is 80% underwater and 20%, I think it is, above water. That's how it is in your life. 20% of your life is beneath the surface, the things that people don't see. And what people see is only a tiny little fraction of what's really going down, going, uh, happening down beneath the surface. We need to make sure, if I want to serve God, if I want to a strong ministry with Him, I need to cultivate a strong, secret life with God. What does that do? That means that when David was under pressure, his cry was, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. When he got in under pressure, what did he do? He ran into the secret place. And he was there together with God. And it might be storming around him, but there in the secret place, there was peace. And from that position, he could go out and face the storm. I read one quote where it said that the one who kneels before God can stand before king. That's kings. That's what David, he was kneeling before God so he could go out and face the storm. Because he kneeled before God, he could go out to Goliath and say, I don't care how big you are because I am sent by God and I have God with me. For David, it didn't matter if uh, Goliath was a giant, was three meters high, four meters high, five meters, I don't know how tall Goliath was. For David, it didn't matter. Why? Because he had a strong personal life with God. And from that personal life, David knew his God. And he knew that my God will not fail me. And if there is a Goliath facing me, my God will help me defeat that giant. So, the three areas that was different in their lives was the fear of the Lord, their patience, 
and their secret life with God. Make sure that you cultivate the fear of the Lord in your life because having the fear of the Lord in your life will make you take the right decisions when pressure comes because you will obey the one you fear. If you fear God more than people, you will obey God when people come and want you to do something that is wrong. If you fear people more than God, then you will sub succumb to, their, to, peop to man's will. Patience, yes, you might have the call of God upon your life, but trust that God will put you where he wants you when the time is right. God made the galaxy. It's no problem from, for him to place you no matter where it is. He can do it in one instant. Just trust him and be willing to serve beneath your calling because that's where your character is being built. Your character is being built when you are serving beneath your calling. That's where humility comes in. Humbleness comes in. Character is being built. And the last point, make sure that you cultivate a strong secret life with God. Even though maybe people are not watching you, make sure you pray, even, not only when you come to church, but also when you're home alone. Make sure you read your Bible, not only when you are in church, but also when you are home alone. Make sure to take care of that personal, passionate relationship with God, because from that position, everything else springs out. Uh, Proverbs says that guard your heart above all other things, from, from it, the issues of life come. It's from your heart. It's from that secret place that all the rest will flow. Amen. Let's take a break here. And, uh...